Good morning and welcome to worship. We're so pleased you've joined us online. And while we miss being together as the family of God, he is still with us and he will minister to each of us as we come to him and worship him in spirit and in truth. You know, with all the potentially frightening news these days, this morning's teaching from Matthew 14 should be a great encouragement to your heart and a strengthening of your faith in our Lord. Let's begin with a declaration of truth from God's word. Would you recite this out loud with me? Psalm 34, I will extol the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. I will glory in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant. Their faces are never covered with shame. This poor one called and the Lord heard him. He saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and he delivers them. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. O oh Lord, we look to you this morning with eyes of faith. We ask that you would minister grace and mercy and peace to us all. We pray this in faith, in Jesus' name, amen. Good morning and welcome. We invite you to worship with us and celebrate the great things that God has done. You've done great. 
Welcome, and thank you again for joining us. If you're with us for the first time, please take a moment and text the word CONNECTION to this number. Then follow the instructions to fill out a digital connection card. One of our staff will contact you this week to say hello and answer any questions you may have about First Baptist. We praise God for our women's ministry. Six weekly Bible studies were offered during the winter semester and a total of 85 ladies attended. Also, 30 women attended a multi-church prayer conference in February. We thank the Lord for what He's doing in our Together Women's Ministry. Typically, at this time, we would continue our worship as we present our tithes and offerings to the Lord. So if you're a member or regular attender of First Baptist, you can still participate by clicking the Give button at the top of the homepage on our website or by texting FBPC to this number. This will enable us to continue to minister to our community and each other all to the glory of God. I would like to take a moment now and guide you through a personal prayer time using the pattern of the Lord's Prayer. I will speak a phrase, then pause to give you time to present your personal prayers to the Lord. Let's begin. Our Father in heaven, holy is your name. Now, greet the Lord. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Pray for God's will. Give us this day our daily bread. Pray for God's provisions. Forgive us our trespasses. Confess your sins to the Lord. As we forgive those who trespass against us, forgive those who have offended you. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Pray for God's protection. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Pray that to the Lord. Father, we're grateful for these moments in your holy presence. As we continue our worship of you, be glorified. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Old things have passed away Your love has stayed the same Your constant grace remains the cornerstone things that we thought were dead are breathing in life again you cause your sun to shine
this have found their hope the orphans now have a home all that was lost has found its place in you lived our Thousand people had followed Jesus to a relatively remote place where they could all sit or stand and hear him as he taught. Uh, as the day passed, they began to get hungry, but most of them hadn't brought food with them, and the disciples were not prepared to feed such a mass of people. They searched, but all that was offered came from a little boy who was naively willing to share his five barley loaves and two fish. It's what his mother had packed. But in childlike faith, he offered it to the disciples who took him to Jesus, who blessed the food, and it was multiplied. As the disciples distributed it, 
more came forth. A miracle was taking place right before their eyes. The disciples continued to show up with food so that eventually everyone was fed and they were all satisfied. And there was even 12 large baskets full of leftovers. 12. Hmm. One for each disciple to hold. So remember that. Well, the multitudes are enamored with Jesus. They want to declare him their king, but it's not time for him to rise to prominence, nor is it his mission to be their earthly king. So Jesus sends his 12 disciples out to a boat to cross the Sea of Galilee, even though it's late in the afternoon. He also dismisses the crowd to return to their homes. We're reading in Matthew 14, verse 22. We'll finish the story in this way. Immediately, he made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. After he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But the boat by this time was a long way from the land where Jesus was. They were beginning to be beaten by the waves, for the wind was against them. And in the fourth watch of the night, 3 a.m. to 6 a.m., Jesus came to his disciples walking on the water. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified, and they said, It's a ghost! And they cried out in fear. But immediately, Jesus spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is me. Don't be afraid. And Peter answered him, Lord, if it's you, command me to come to you on the water. And he said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. And immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and took hold of him, saying, O oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. And those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. What a declaration of their faith. After a scary storm, an exhausting night, a misunderstood ghost, a step of faith that could have been tragic, a merciful hand, a loving rebuke, a calming of the storm, and a bowing of their knees in response to worship Jesus, the Son of God. Darkness comes, the boat's a long way from land, and a storm has begun. That was a common experience on the Sea of Galilee. It produces resistant winds and high waves. Uh, notice that in verse 24, beaten by the waves, for the wind was against them. So they're trying to obey Jesus' directive and get to the other side, but the winds are making the rowing a lot more difficult. And the waves relentlessly beat the boat. Storms in life can be relentless, can't they? They frustrate us. I never minimize how challenging a storm can be in someone's life. They will come. I suspect the disciples were miserable, trying to row forward against the wind and waves throughout the night. They should have arrived a long time ago. But it was at least 3 a.m. They're still rowing, weary and frustrated. And that's lesson one. Storms will come to our lives, and they won't be pleasant. Following Jesus does not exempt us from life's hardships. 
At this point, the text doesn't reveal that the disciples had done anything wrong, and yet they are being beaten by the waves. The wind is against them. And as long as we live in this world, that will happen. In fact, as Christians, we will often be led against the current of culture. It does not mean we're being punished or suffering because of some sin. Sometimes difficult things are just allowed by God. However, those difficulties are training times. Peter wrote this, for a little while, you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you've not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him. And you are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the end result of your faith. The salvation of your souls. Storms, they, they don't destroy anyone's faith. Rather, they reveal and they refine our faith. Think about Job. If he had cursed God and committed suicide, his lack of faith would have been revealed. But because Job responded, the Lord gives, the Lord takes away, blessed be the name of the Lord, his faith was revealed as genuine. And like gold that is refined and purified by the fire, his faith was refined and purified in his losses. He emerged more faithful to the Lord, and so it will be with each of us. Storms will come, but in these times, God is at work. He's revealing to us what he already sees, whether our faith is genuine or not. And if it is genuine, like gold, our faith is being refined to become more pure and valuable. Verse 25, and in the fourth watch of the night, 3 a.m. to 6 a.m., Jesus came to them walking on the sea. So lesson one, storms will come. Lesson two, when they do, listen to Jesus. He knew where his disciples were. He knew what they were going through. He knew when it was time to reveal himself, and he was there to help them and teach them. You know, one of the most dramatic and difficult experiences in my life was when my son Nick was very sick. Uh, we took him to the emergency room. He had gotten poisoning, and the doctors thought it was something far worse. Uh, as he lay there crying, looking up to me for help, I felt so helpless. I wanted to cry, but I didn't dare do that in front of him. In those moments, he needed me to be strong and reassuring. And so by faith, I cried out to the Lord for help and strength and healing and comfort. And as I did, waves of God's presence flowed over me and over Nick. He began to calm down. He was still sick, but he had a calm within. Together we prayed aloud for help. God was there. I cried out and he heard me and answered me. It was horrible, but God helped. And he got us through that. What I learned is that I can't promise anyone how it will turn out, but what I can promise them is what scriptures promise, that God is with us and he will help us in our times of need. Verse 26. When the disciples saw him, that is Jesus, walking on the sea, 
They were terrified and they said, it's a ghost. And they cried out in fear. Grown men, terrified, crying out, expressing their superstitious beliefs, it's a ghost. Now, it was common in that culture to believe in the reality of ghosts, and the presence of a ghost meant something bad was going to happen. So their response was consistent with how they had been raised in that culture. Fortunately, their false beliefs are exposed by Jesus and that situation, and they will have opportunity to embrace correct beliefs. Verse 27, immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. Notice, before Jesus calmed the storm, Jesus calmed them. We usually want him to calm the storm and then we'll be calm. But he wants us to be calm no matter what the storm is. And then notice the enemy's tactic. Uh, Jesus arrives and they think he's a ghost. That is someone who will harm them, whose presence is a foreboding of bad things. But that's just the opposite of what is true. Jesus doesn't harm his family. He helps them. His presence is not a foreboding of bad things, but good things. In fact, he causes all things to work together for good to those who love him. So Jesus wants his disciples to stop crying out in fear and learn to put their faith in him. We know that because at the conclusion of this teaching experience, Jesus will ask them, O oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? Well, it's usually because we're believing lies, which is why Jesus speaks to them. He needs to expose their lies and present the truth. He needs their faith to rise in them and defeat their doubts and fears. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of Christ, Romans 10, 17. So what did Christ say to them? Take heart, be of good cheer, have courage. It is I, I'm here. Do not be afraid. Don't live in fear. So what's the script? Jesus is giving them. Have courage. I am here. Do not be afraid. Could you say that wherever you are out loud with me? Have courage. I am here. Don't be afraid. Interestingly, Jesus did not immediately come onto the boat. He remained at a distance. Why? I believe so they could see his power over the storm. The boat was affected. The men were affected. But Jesus was not affected by the storm. It was a sight that he wanted etched into their memories. Him standing in the storm on top of the water unaffected, an example of how he wanted them and us to learn to live unaffected by the storms of life. Verse 28, and Peter answered him, Lord, if it's you, command me to come to you on the water. If? <laughs> so they still don't believe it was Jesus? I mean, what would it take for them to believe? Well, I don't know. What will it take for you and me to really believe? Jesus said, come. Now, I've often wondered how that scene played out. Uh, Peter on the boat with the 12 disciples, looking at them, and then them looking at him, and 
I would imagine he's like, and they're like, go, go, man. I'm not going. You go. I don't know how it played out. But Peter is invited to go. I doubt he just jumped over and landed on the water. I suspect he kind of crawled over the side and maybe put his foot down to see if there was going to be firm footing or if he was going to go down. And however he went, he got out of the boat and he walked on the water and he went to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, that is, he saw the effects of the wind, he was afraid. And it wasn't just a normal fear, because we know the response was he began to sink. And so there is this crippling, consuming fear that comes upon him. Jesus is right there, but he's taking his eyes off Jesus. He's looking at his circumstances, and therefore he begins to sink. And the same thing will happen with all of us when we take our focus off Jesus. Fortunately, as he begins to sink, he knows what to do. He cries out, Lord, save me. And Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him. Now that lesson seems obvious. Stay focused on Jesus or you're sunk. We sink in storms because we focus on our circumstances and the possibilities of the bad that could happen. Peter should have just kept walking toward Jesus and keeping his focus on him. But he didn't. He let the winds and waves of adversity draw his attention off Jesus. Verse 30, and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. And Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him. So lesson one, storms will come. Lesson two, when they do, listen to Jesus. And lesson three, if fear is winning, call out to Jesus. That's what Peter did, and it worked. Notice, this is the third time that Matthew uses the word immediately in this section. The first time in verse 22, right after feeding the 5,000, Jesus got them on the boat and sent them on their way. The second time, verse 27, when the disciples cried out in fear, Jesus immediately calmed them down. And then this third time, when Peter began to sink, Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of Peter. Fear was winning in Peter, but he did what a child would do in childlike faith. He cried out, Lord, save me. Are you too proud to cry out to Jesus? Man, I am not. I can't tell you how many times in my life I've been entrenched in a spiritual battle and I felt like I was failing, uh, getting defeated, discouraged, and I would simply cry out to Jesus, Lord, save me. Really? Jesus doesn't require more of that from us. I mean, that's not a very impressive prayer. But then again, Jesus told us in Matthew 6 not to pray to impress him or other people. We pray to be honest and genuine with him. And if that is the honest, genuine expression of your faith, Lord, save me, it appears from the text that that is a prayer Jesus will answer. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand, pulled Peter up out of the water. Now, we don't know if he carried him back to the boat or if Peter walked beside Jesus to the boat. But what we do know is that Peter got back to the boat safely with Jesus' help. <laughs> How kind of Jesus. After Peter had messed up cried out in terror, it's a ghost, and then boldly walked on the water, but then messed up again and took his focus off Jesus. Well, that wouldn't be the last time that Jesus would have to save Peter. But Jesus was patient, kind, loving, and there saving Peter. 
Because that's what Jesus does for all of us. He doesn't just save us from our sin, which is magnificent for him to do. After that, he saves us again and again in situations when we cry out, when we are afraid, when we sink in storms. He doesn't abandon us. Notice that once he got Peter to safety, Jesus did want to use it as a teaching experience for him and really for all his disciples, who I'm sure were watching everything. Verse 31, saying to him, O you of little faith, why did you doubt? When I was standing there right in front of you, why did you doubt? Why did you fear what the wind and waves could do to you, but not believe what I could do for you? I suspect that as Peter got back to the boat, uh, they had to maneuver around the 12 baskets of leftover food that they had collected from the miracle of the feeding, uh, a reminder right in front of them of the gracious and lavish provisions of God. How long would it take for them to learn and believe? Well, how long will it take for you and me to learn and believe? Verse 32, and when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. The idea is that Jesus had control over the storm. Now to the Jews, only God could walk on water and only God could calm a storm. Here, Jesus does both, again proving his deity. No wonder, verse 33, those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. So lesson one, storms will come. Lesson two, when they do, listen to Jesus. Lesson three, if fear is winning, call out to Jesus. And lesson four, when he saves you, worship him. Worship that word means to kneel or prostrate oneself before expressing honor. Uh, we find that word used when the wise men fell down and worshiped the baby Jesus. Because worship includes our hearts and our bodies. And then they presented their gifts to him because giving is an expression of worship. Worship also means to adore, to honor, to extol greatly. So there they are, his 12 disciples in a boat in the middle of the Sea of Galilee, early in the dark midst of the morning, bowing and worshiping Jesus, saying, truly, you are the Son of God. Well, he knew it, but in that storm, they learned it. The storms in life can teach us a lot about ourselves, but more importantly, they, they teach us about Jesus and who he truly is. Today, have you learned who Jesus really is? God the Son, proven by his divine actions, multiplying a little lunch to fully feed 20,000 plus people silencing the wind and stopping the waves to comfort his beloved disciples. What has he done for you? What might he do for you today? Are you in a storm? Are you terrified and crying out in fear? Do you have a sense of foreboding of what might come? Then today, would you let Jesus reveal himself to you. Listen to his voice through his word. Here are today's faith-strengthening lessons. Lesson one, storms will come. Lesson two, when they do, listen to Jesus. Lesson three, if fear is winning, call out to Jesus. And lesson four, when he saves you, Worship Him.
the splendor of our King, clothed in majesty, let all the earth rejoice, all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in light, and dark And trembles at his voice, trembles at his voice. How great is our God, sing with me. How great is our God, and all will see how great, how great. to thank you for worshiping with us today. Our prayer is, is that you have been drawn closer to the Lord through the singing of praises, through the prayers that have been offered, and by hearing God's Word preached. Throughout Scripture, when people encounter God in His Word, God calls them to respond to Him. 
That response can look different for each person. And we want to help you to take your next step in your relationship with Him. For some of you, you have never really started your journey with God. You sense God is speaking to you and you know that you need to make some kind of response to Jesus, but you don't know what to do. You can click the link, Follow Jesus, to learn how you can have a personal relationship with Him to experience true peace. For those who are followers of Jesus, you may have a prayer request or you want to communicate to us a decision you've made concerning your faith journey. You can click on the communication card link below to let us know how we can help you. Finally, for those who are members of the church or attend regularly, you can continue to participate in ministering to our community by clicking on the Give link below. Thanks again for worshiping with us. We invite you to share this video with others, and you can like us, follow us, or subscribe to us on your preferred media platform. See you next time. God bless.